Hello, this is David Harper of Bionic Turtle with a very quick overview of the Basel II framework that determines the regulatory capital banks need to hold. The Basel II rules are very complicated and detailed, so this is really a whirlwind orientation designed for the FRM candidate. The Basel Committee is an advisory body that consists of the supervisors among the so-called Group of Ten or G10 countries. That happens to include now 11 nations. The Basel Committee reports to central bankers but has no legal authority over them. And so it is up to individual comp countries to adopt the Basel II framework. This helps explain explains why the timing and the particular adoption of Basel II varies by country. Not all countries are adopting Basel II at the same time and exactly in the same way. When we speak of the Basel Accord, there, it's helpful to remember there are basically two Basel Accords. Some people still don't understand this. The original Basel Accord was implemented in 1988. So we call that the original accord or the 1988 capital accord. It had several goals, including to, pr to protect against systematic risk and to ensure the solvency of the major participating banks. One of the things that's been largely preserved in the Basel II framework is this 8% ratio, sometimes called an 8% Cook ratio. So the original Basel Accord required banks to hold regulatory capital of at least 8% against their total risk-weighted assets. However, the original accord was severely flawed in several respects, including, for example, it allowed banks to conduct so-called regulatory arbitrage. And so as soon as, as soon as even 1999, the Basel Committee started on the work and many, many revisions and quantitative impact studies that ultimately led to the Basel II framework that we currently now refer to. That original accord only addressed credit risk, or really only included credit risk in the denominator. And, the, and so the 1996 Amendment for Market Risk was added and this is another aspect which has been almost entirely preserved in the Basel II framework. So the original accord included cut credit risk. In 1996, the amendment added market risk. And that holds and applies and carries over into the Basel II framework, which itself added the operational risk. And so before we get into the weeds, what I'd like to say about the Basel II framework is that it's three pillars and referring to the three major risk buckets, credit risk, market risk, and operational risk. Interestingly, there are some risks that are omitted and have been the subject of work even currently this year. The first pillar contains the quantitative rules for determining the minimum capital requirements. And so because this has the formulas and the rules around the minimum capital, this is the pillar that's received a lot of the attention. But as complex as this first pillar is, it still essentially boils down to this 8% Cook ratio. There are some, there are some nuances at the margin, but it's total eligible capital, that's the regulatory capital, divided by the risk-weighted assets, which now includes credit, market, and operational risk. That ratio needs to be at least 8%. The numerator has largely, for the most part, been unchanged over the years. This is total eligible regulatory capital. It's got its own set of rules but comes in three tiers. Tier one is the core tier. This is the equity capital. It's buffer of the highest quality. Tier two is supplementary capital, and it subdivides and has its own rules, including, for example, the bank can't use more tier two than tier one. There's also tier three, which can only be used to cover the market risk. But we have three tiers of eligible capital. Those are the numerator. And then it's up to the definition of what are the risk-weighted assets. And that's where most of the dramatic changes have taken place in Basel II. And so, for example, if I just briefly share my map, I'm not going to go into any detail here. 
We've got rules for credit risk. And immediately we'll see something thematic in Basel II, and that is that there isn't just one approach. That's by design. There are There is in each case, for each major risk bucket, a basic or standardized approach. And then there is one or more advanced approaches or internal approaches. And this was by design because Basel wanted banks to probably start with the basic approach and then migrate to more advanced approaches. So the advanced approaches have the benefit that they theoretically will measure risk more precisely, but the price of that is they have many more stringent criteria, qualitative and criteria that are required for the bank to meet in order for the bank to earn into eligibility to use the advanced approaches. So that's the idea. Maybe start here, unless you're a very big bank right off the bat and have the resources to do so, and then evolve into more advanced internal-based approach where you use internal models and earn a lower capital charge. And if I just move down, associated with credit risk are rules around credit risk mitigation and securitization. So there are standardized and internal approaches there. And then there are the set of rules around determining the market risk charge, which has a standardized approach, and you guessed it, an internal models-based approach, which is been called revolutionary by Philip Jorian and includes the procedure or the requirements around using value at risk and importantly around back testing that value at risk. And finally, in addition to the market risk, we have the most recent set of rules around the operational risk bucket. Remember, I'm still in pillar one and we're really in the denominator of that 8% ratio. And so most recently, operational risk has been added. And you guessed it, there are uh, three, at least three basic approaches under operational risk. Basic, standardized, and then in, when you get into a very fluid uh, advanced set of advanced measurement approaches. So those are the three buckets. Coming back to this capital requirement, that help the that set the rules for deciding what's in the denominator here. We need eligible capital against all three of those buckets. And that really is the first pillar for the minimum capital. And then we have the second pillar and the third pillar. The second pillar is the supervisory review, and this has been called the load bearing pillar, and we can expect this to receive even more attention. It's meant to complement the first pillar because rules by themselves will not be sufficient. And so if I go over to just my brief sketch of the second pillar, there are some key principles which basically empower supervisors but also give them the responsibility to monitor the bank, to assess the efficacy of the um, application of the first pillar. And so there's a lot of burden here placed on the supervisors to situationally assess the efficacy of the risk measurement and the risk management. So the second pillar, pillar is very important load bearing pillar. And then the third pillar was also designed to acknowledge the weakness in leaning or relying just on the first pillar by itself. And that is that Banks are special, they're opaque, they're complicated. This third pillar imposes market discipline by deploying a set of rigorous disclosure requirements. So this, this third pillar makes the bank disclose many, many details about its risk exposures on the theory that this will better inform investors and help them apply market discipline. And so that's the three pillars that anchor, again, the, if I go back here, the anchor the Basel II framework and help to, to ensure that the bank uh, holds at least 8% of eligible capital against its three major risk buckets. This is David Harper, the Bionic Turtle. Thanks for your time.